Bé, era una Barcelona insòlita. It was an extraordinary Barcelona. Everything had changed. You couldn't tell Barcelona was at war, but you could tell there was a revolution going on. And there were far more flags and many people in the streets calling for volunteers, and many lorries leaving for the front, and many songs. There had never been so much singing. People of Barcelona celebrated. Within days of the army rising, revolution had burst out spontaneously in most of Republican Spain. The Republican government was hopeless. Later, government and revolution would come into confrontation, a confrontation that would help to seal the fate of the Republic. Madrid and other Republican cities, columns of workers' militia set out to fight the army rebels. In these first weeks of the Civil War, the militias were the only real defense of the Republic. They were young, enthusiastic, recklessly confident. But the columns had been thrown together in haste. Worse, each column was linked to one of the different parties or trade unions. There was no coordination, no central command. At first, socialist and communist, anarchists and moderate republicans marched together. Later, their deep disagreements about war and revolution were to threaten the fighting power and the very existence of the republic. But now in July 1936, the ecstasy and hope of revolution dominated men and women. Everything had changed, even in the building. The matadors put away their brilliant uniforms and in street clothes raised the clenched fist. Catalonia was the anarchist stronghold. Here the revolution was more profound, more extreme. By the end of July, anarchists who had seized weapons to defeat the rising dominated the city of Barcelona. It was a moment anarchist militants like Josep Costa had been waiting for. Però en aquells moments, quan se produeix el trencament, quan la societat rebenta, At that moment, when society burst wide open, there was such tremendous enthusiasm among the working class, and this was channeled through the unions, the parties, everywhere. Els partits polítics, a tots els llocs on la gent concorria, People participated with such enthusiasm, with such vitality, that it's very difficult to describe it now after so many years and to examine that situation coldly. But I do have to say that among ourselves, many of us said, now's the time to destroy all that has been oppressing us. The Catalan government ruled only in name. All structures of power collapsed. Churches and monasteries were burned and looted. Helpless, the Catalan government offered power to the anarchists, but true to their principles, they refused it. The anarchists believed that out of this revolutionary explosion, the people would create their own free society, 
without state, church or capitalism. Federico Mansegne was a famous anarchist orator. Had we taken power because we were the majority, it would have meant betraying a pact of common struggle we had, in a way, sealed with the blood of so many of our men from many different sides. Communists, socialists, syndicalists, and above all, anarchists. It would have meant betraying that pact and doing in Catalonia what Lenin and Trotsky had done in the Soviet Union with the takeover of power by the Bolsheviks. We didn't do it, and we have been criticized many times for it. With hindsight, who knows, perhaps, perhaps we should have done it. Some anarchists now feel that their refusal to take power was the beginning of their undoing. At that time, the anarchists had no doubt about their main objective, to defeat fascism. But for them, the campaign was not just against the army rebels, but against capitalism itself. While the columns surged out to defeat the enemy, committees of workers in the town struggled to construct a new order out of the confusion. At that time, it seemed impossible to solve those initial difficulties. But looking back, people really showed a lot of common sense. Everything was improvised. You could call it a miracle, despite the religious meaning of the word. It was a miracle achieved by the ordinary people. As the chaos subsided, this new revolutionary society began to function. Much of the Catalan economy was now being run by the workers themselves. In Barcelona, trams and cinemas, factories, department stores and even greyhound tracks were run by their own employees. The trade unions sought to food supplies. Union lorries drove out to the villages with goods to exchange for food. Barter, not purchasing, kept Barcelona fed for the first weeks of the Civil War. In some places, money itself, seen by anarchists as inherently evil, was abolished. Shopping was done with vouchers, issued by local committees. What do these vouchers represent? Well, they had to represent hours of production, the hours spent by a carpenter building a piece of furniture, or the hours spent by a peasant harvesting, working on the fields. Everything was calculated in hours of production. The peasants liked it because it meant making them equal to the industrial workers, making all work equal. Vouchers bought bread at the bakers, but they now also bought lunch to the Barcelona Ritz, the big hotels have been turned into hospitals or into canteens serving cheap meals to militiamen and working class families, as this anarchist newsreel proclaimed. In sus grandes cocinas, se prepara la comida para cuantos van al hotel a saciar su apetito. amplios comedores que antes ocupaban maquilladas y frívolas damiselas, grandes financieros, capitanes de industria, aristócratas ociosos y aventureros internacionales de toda la haya, ahora están abarrotados de hombres y mujeres humildes que siguen el ritmo de la sociedad que se está creando. Barcelona trabaja y come, esa es su fuerza y su virtud. Now that the factories and workplaces were in the hands of the workers, anarchist union leaders like Josep Costa fought to start production again. 
We tell the workers to get back to the factory and wait for our instructions. Immediately we called all the factory owners and executives to a meeting at the town hall. We tell them, well gentlemen, something big has happened here. We don't know what's going to happen, but the factories have to continue functioning. We ask you to be at work again tomorrow at whatever hour you're supposed to start. Five o'clock or eight o'clock. Agreed? Agreed. But we have to warn you, labor relations will be very different from now on. The CNT, the anarchist trade union, had been taken by surprise when the revolution began. It was anarchist militants who rallied the workers to take over their industries. Where the old bosses remained, they had to take orders from these workers' committees. Nearly 2,000 enterprises were collectivized in Catalonia, the greatest experiment in workers' self-management Western Europe has ever seen. The workers now set about improving their working conditions. Free medical care and adequate pensions were introduced. But at the same time, some of the old employers were hounded as enemies of the people. Six days after it started, around July the 25th, 10 or 11 industrialists were killed in Terrassa. They were murdered. The Catalan bourgeoisie was seized by this general panic. Everybody thought his head was going to be chopped off any minute. I told my father that we should leave. We still had time to leave because everything was so chaotic. But he said, if God wants me to be killed, they can kill me. But I'm staying. Revolutionary terror spread through the Republican areas. The middle classes in most of Spain had supported the army rebellion. But the liberal Catalan middle classes had remained largely pro-Republican. Now they became the victims of this terror and turned against the Republic. I didn't belong to this side. I wasn't an anarchist. I wasn't a communist. I was a liberal man who respected other people's way of thinking. And on the other hand, I could never have fought on Franco's side, which was, and still is, totally opposed to my way of thinking. For the moderate Republican government, the revolution was threatening to split society. It also threatened its chances of winning the war. The Spanish communists took the same view. But it was not only the killings and the collectives that shocked the middle class. The revolution had destroyed a traditional way of life. The power of the church and its moral code disintegrated. For many women on the Republican side, it was a time of astonishing liberation. That revolutionary explosion gave us women absolute freedom. We couldn't live war as men were living it. For men, things hadn't changed all that much. Our lives, however, had really changed. Women took men's places not only in factories, not only as a workforce, not only in the war industry. It was all women. At that time, to be a woman and to be young was the ultimate. The revolution brought women instant and radical changes. Abortion was soon made available on demand. Initially, women went to the front to fight and die in the trenches. For Spanish feminists, prostitution was a relic of capitalist exploitation to be abolished. They set up schools to re-educate prostitutes. 
Revolutionary vice squads cleaned up the red light district of Barcelona. But it wasn't easy to change old habits overnight. At the Union there were arguments. We've heard that you shut the brothels. Where will people go now? The others would reply, they can find a girlfriend or get married. That can't be done overnight, they'd say. You could have shut two brothels today, another two tomorrow, so that people could get used to the idea. The same with the tavern. What about the waiters? What will they do for a living? Teach them another trade. Where? You see, there were those we called the pragmatists, the realists who could see the revolution wasn't easy. But then there were the moralists, those who gave the Spanish revolution the healthy air it had. Anarchists disapproved of marriage, believing that couples should unite or part freely without any license from church or state. Young revolutionaries happily adopted their advice, but many mothers were appalled by free love. Some mothers even came to the Union to speak with people they considered apostles of free love. Look, my daughter has left home without telling me. She's living somewhere with, with someone. We'd say, we're all in favor of it. Yes, but that boy will leave, and we don't even know his name. Well, anyway, the Union decided this had to be legalized somehow. So they invented what they called revolutionary weddings. Revolutionaries. Revolutionary weddings took many different forms. This is what happened in the Barcelona Woodworkers' Union. We made three copies of the marriage certificate, the original and two more. The union kept the original, and one copy each was given to the man and the woman, who were told, if at any time you have any problems and wish to separate, come here with both pieces of paper. We'll take our copy and set fire to the three of them, and you'll be free again. That was the official wedding ceremony. But as with many other things, it became necessary to force the situation a bit, because there wasn't enough time for persuasion and proper education. So the president of the union, a very amusing man from Seville, would take the man aside after the ceremony and tell him, look, what we said about burning the documents isn't quite as easy as you think. It's something that has to be thought about carefully and properly weighed up. So don't come here pestering me, because if you do, I'll give you such a kick in the balls. You'll remember it for the rest of your days, right? So off you go. Be happy. Long live the revolution. These revolutionary changes were taking place throughout Republican Spain. Led by improvised military commanders like Buenaventura Duruti, the militia columns pushed their way towards the front. Young laborers rushed to join the militia. As the columns advanced, they spread the revolution. The ancient dream of a collective society without profit or property was made reality in the villages of Aragon. In many places, money itself was abolished. All forms of production were owned by the community, run by their workers. These collectives formed an independent anarchist area within the Republic. The Council of Aragon coordinated their activities. Mas de las Matas was one of the many Aragonese villages collectivized in the summer of 1936. For the villagers, the experience has now become a well-remembered legend. These three men were among the young local anarchists who abolished private property in Mas de las Matas. Benigno Castanier was a carpenter. 
We built a sufficiently large workshop on the outskirts of the village and all the carpenters went to work there. They appointed a delegate to represent them at the collectivization committee. The same was done for the bricklayers, the barbers, the blacksmiths, for every trade, the tailors also. Well, all the barbers had joined the collective voluntarily. They were all in it voluntarily, weren't they? A large shop was found for them, and the three or four barbers in the village all brought along their tools and their chairs, and they all worked there for free. <laughs> and most of their work was done when the peasants came back from the fields in the evening. This also caused some problems because some people would say, Look at those lazy barbers. They spend the whole day walking around doing nothing. So we had to explain to everybody that they worked until 10 p.m. so that everybody could be served. Some people just didn't realize how late the barbers had to work. Well, this is one of those minor inconveniences. The anarchists forced all known right-wingers in the village to join the collective as well. The upheaval of revolution led to terrorism and repression. In Aragon, as in Catalonia, armed gangs drove around killing the better off, the right-wingers, and the followers of the church. In Mas de las Matas, although the local committee tried to prevent it, six right-wingers were murdered just outside the village. Here, the only people allowed to keep their property were those left-wingers who were not anarchists. For the rest, members of the collective by choice are out of fear. The old world of cash and property, rich and poor, now disappeared. Money was abolished and we created what we called the family card with all the members of the family and everything that wasn't produced here was allotted according to the numbers in each family. For example, sugar, rice, even meat, a hundred grams per person per day. And it was the same for everybody. There were no preferences. Everybody ate as much as they wanted of the local produce. So money for use in the village was completely abolished. The first problem was that because everything was free, coffee, tobacco, this was a problem. Everything was free, so everybody wanted to drink coffee, everybody wanted to smoke and so on. So this is something that had to be corrected and that's when we started rationing cigarettes. No, no, tobacco was rationed, but we never denied anybody his cigarettes. This was a contradiction for us because we were against all vices, and yet we were well aware that by handing out free cigarettes we encouraged people to smoke, but we couldn't deny them to anybody. For the anarchist peasants in Mas de las Matas and in other villages, collectivization brought instant benefits. The profit motive had disappeared. Everyone now worked only for the community. I joined the collective fully convinced, and I gave everything. At home they were nearly crying because I took everything to the collective. Our sheep, all our money, everything. And with such enthusiasm. And working as much as we did before because the harvest had been delayed. We worked day and night. In this summer of 1936, the revolution was triumphing in most of Republican Spain but it was already failing in its most basic task, to win the war. Everywhere the militias were being held or defeated by the advancing rebel armies. In this crisis, the Republic was divided. For some, the government and the communists, revolution must wait until the war was won. For the anarchists and many socialists, the only way to win the war was to defend and extend the revolution. This argument was soon to tear apart and transform the Republic, unleashing a civil war within the civil war. In central and northern Spain, the army rebels were winning the war. General Franco soon became the absolute 
political and military ruler of the nationalist side as his regular soldiers captured town after town. The militia columns, brave but disorganized, had no unified command. The revolution had left the Republican government helpless. And yet, initially, the new revolutionary leaders did not form a new central government or military command of their own. Two months after the start of the war, Franco's troops were approaching Madrid. Now, at last, with the Republic on the brink of defeat, the politicians in Madrid took action. In September 1936, the Socialist Union leader Francisco Lago Caballero formed a so-called Government of Victory with Socialist and Communist ministers. A strong military command was formed. Further revolution was discouraged. The anarchist revolution still controlled much of Catalonia and Aragon, The anarchist leaders refused on principle to join the new central government. But this government of victory was going to centralize political decision making and leave the anarchists out in the cold. The new Madrid government was a triumph for the rapidly expanding Communist Party. In line with Stalin's policy, they stood for an anti fascist popular front, an alliance of left wing and middle class parties which would appear moderate and responsible enough to win support from Western democracies. They also wanted to check the revolution and impose their discipline. Aparecía claro que entrábamos en una guerra civil. It was clear that we were entering a civil war and that we were facing an organized enemy with an organized army and that we needed a real army ourselves. And the starting point for this army was the 5th Regiment. The discipline of the 5th Regiment was powerful propaganda for the communist approach to the war. The communists helping to build a new popular army believed in the values of obedience, rank, authority. Their old rivals, the anarchists, were anti-militarist, opposed on principle to hierarchical discipline. For them, War, like revolution, must be made through popular initiative. I have always believed that the day they started to militarize the people, the day that the spontaneous nature of popular combat was destroyed, we started to lose the war. And this is something the communists have always refused to accept. But all styles of war need weapons and the Soviet Union soon became the only country prepared to supply them in large quantities. This in turn increased the influence of the Spanish communists. A minority party when the Civil War began, they were now becoming the strongest political force in the Republic. Soviet military aid arrived just in time to help defend the Spanish capital. No pasaran. There shall not pass. By November, Franco's troops had encircled Madrid on three sides. When the final attack came, the people of Madrid fought shoulder to shoulder with loyal officers and with the Republican militias who had been retreating for the past four months. The attack on Madrid was beaten back. The defense of Madrid became a legend and it gave the Republic fresh hope for victory. The anarchist military commander Duruti died in the battle for Madrid. His funeral in Barcelona became an immense anarchist show of faith. But the movement was already beginning to split under the pressure of its own internal contradictions. With the enemy at the gates of Madrid, the anarchist leaders had shelved their principles and joined the government. 
Four anarchists became ministers in the central government. Others had already joined the Catalan regional government. Their followers were shocked and confused. Moreover, in Catalonia, the anarchist heartland, anarchist collectivization was being checked. The regional government was asserting control of the industries which anarchists had collectivized. Josep Tarradeas was a Catalan finance councillor. I was the first councillor and finance councillor of the regional government, the Generalitat. Therefore, faced with the CNT's refusal to allow control over the collectivized industries, I ordered all the banks not to cash any checks or hand over money to them without my permission. So the workers found themselves in a difficult situation. They would run out of money and at the bank they would be told, no, I need the Generalitat's permission. So then they would come to us and we would say, no, unless you allow us to control the collective. As the anarchists weakened, the communists became stronger. The party attracted many who felt threatened by the revolution. Middle-class moderates who admired communist discipline at the front and order and restraint behind the lines. Revolutionary chaos still reigned in much of Republican Spain. This led to an overwhelming feeling of unease in the country. And as we were in favor of discipline and control, of laying down all the rules necessary for re-establishing the army, the police, the courts of justice, well, obviously, all these things were welcomed by the population. But the communist methods of recruitment attracted bitter criticism from other parties in the Republic. In contrast with the other parties, the Communist Party opened its doors unconditionally and without any controls to anybody who wanted to join. What they wanted was to build up their party by taking advantage of the very special circumstances in Spain at the time. So that's the way they did it. They were very smart about it. It was easy to grow that way. They made the soldier, sergeant, the sergeant lieutenant, and the professional man captain. They cultivated people's ambition so that they became unconditional supporters. They made sure that people who had no influence in their civilian lives became important in military terms. The communists had been forced to change their line. At first they had opposed the revolution as a threat to the republic. In March 1937, they admitted that significant revolutionary gains had been made but any further changes would have to wait. The overriding aim must be to win the war. For the communists, this meant bringing home rule in Catalonia and the Basque country under central control. One source of friction between the central government and Catalonia was control over the war industry. The only factory that had cartucheria the only cartridge factory in our zone was near Toledo. So my trip to Madrid was to ask the central government that because the factory was still in our hands, it should be brought to Catalonia, which was the only place where it could function properly. Taradez's visit to Madrid ended in failure. The government, wary of growing regional power, refused his request. So I left Madrid without the Toledo factory. A short while later, I heard, as did all the other Spaniards, that Toledo had fallen into the hands of General Franco. They chose, in a way, to leave this factory in Franco's hands rather than have it in a place where it could have been useful. But these squabbles over regional rights were far less ominous than the collision between communists and their political rivals over the whole future of the Republic. At this meeting in March 1937, Jose Diaz, the Communist General Secretary, asked, Who are the enemies of the Republic? He answered himself, Fascists, Uncontrollables and Trotskyists. He was following Stalin's policy in the Soviet Union. There, the Uncontrollables, the Anarchists, had already been purged. 
the Spanish Civil War coincided with the height of Stalin's purges of his political rivals. Leon Trotsky had been exiled in 1929. Bolshevik veterans like Zinoviev and Kamen have also seen here in 1926 at a state funeral, were executed in 1936. Trotskyist was a label given to any independent Marxist who defied the instructions of Stalin and the Comintern in Moscow. Communists in Western Europe justified these purges. Trotsky was pilloried as a Nazi agent. Bill Bailey was an American communist fighting with the international brigades. We had heard that Joe Stalin was trying to keep the country secured and safe uh, and get rid of all the enemies that were trying to constantly tear down the Soviet Union. Therefore, he was conducting these type of purges, and we were led to believe that they were enemies of the people, enemies of the Russian people, consequently the enemies of the working class, every place. And later on, of course, it proved that he was wrong, that he was nothing but a paranoid, sick SOB in many cases. And these people that were purged came from the background of fighting for the, the great ideals of socialism. They went through all the aches and pains and the terror to create this society, only to be taken out later as dogs and shot. The PUM was an independent Spanish Marxist party which largely attacked Stalin's dictatorship. Following the Moscow line, the Spanish communists called the PUM Trotskyist, which it wasn't and accused it of collaborating with fascism. Frank Deegan was a Liverpool docker who had volunteered to fight in Spain. Well, we were informed by our political commissars that our troops who were on the Anakin front, who were mainly composed of anarchist uh, divisions and uh, members of the PU, who were commonly known as Trotskyists, were fraternising with the enemy, even uh, playing football matches. By the 1st of May, 1937, the political tension in Barcelona was so acute that the May Day Parade had to be cancelled. The anarchists and the PUM were still powerful in the city. The communists were impatient for a showdown, as was the central government, with the exception, of course, of the anarchist ministers. The conflict began here, at the Barcelona Telephone Exchange, which was still run by anarchists. One of the girls on duty that day was Enriqueta Garcia Tavera. I was at the switchboard near the window. The anarchist guards were half asleep over their rifles. At about three o'clock, I looked out and saw three lorry loads of assault guards pull up outside. They jumped out and raced into the building. They started going up the stairs. I think most of the anarchist guards were on the first floor. Then I heard shots and I was even more frightened. The anarchists saw this as the all-out challenge they had been expecting. They raised barricades throughout the city. Shooting began in the streets. On the Aragon front, some anarchist units began to march back to Barcelona. The anarchist Juan Manuel Molina was defence under secretary in Catalonia. I phoned all the commanders of the divisions at the front and told them to stay put and secure their sectors. But everything was quiet. I told them everything was under control in Barcelona and that we had more than enough men here. On the Barcelona streets, the anarchists could have used their superior strength before the government reinforcements arrived. The truth is that in Barcelona we controlled the situation. I hadn't intervened yet. All the military barracks were in my hands. Except for the Karl Marx barracks, and we had it surrounded by the people, just waiting for my orders to attack. The anarchist ministers rushed to Barcelona. One of them, Federica Monsigny, appealed to her followers over the radio. She argued that they could not afford a civil war behind the lines. 
haciéndoles comprender que no podía continuar. I tried to make them understand that they couldn't go on fighting, that they had to lay down their weapons and end that fight, that the battlefronts would collapse and it would all end shamefully in front of the whole world. This appeal horrified the anarchist militants of the barricades. Their leaders, they thought, had betrayed them. To lay down their arms would mean the end of their revolution. At the barricades, you heard all the insults you can possibly imagine. Old militants were saying that the ministers had forgotten what it was like to be a worker, that the revolution had to be carried out of the barricades and out of the ministers, and they were going to shoot those ministers. There I heard all those threats from people who were disappointed, and they all remembered what had happened to the anarchists under the Bolsheviks in Russia. And they feared the same would happen here, as it did eventually, that they would be victims of the repression of the communists. The Republic brought in troops to put down the insurrection. Five days of fighting had left about 500 dead. The anarchist power and their revolutionary vision of the future now lay shattered. That's where we lost the war, the revolution and all the hopes that the Spanish people had placed in the transformation. That's where it all ended, in the May events. The May events also overthrew Largo Caballero, the socialist prime minister of the Republic. He had been too independent, too tolerant for communist taste. Now he was forced out of office and replaced by Juan Negrín, another socialist, but more authoritarian than Largo Caballero. With the anarchist revolution checked in Catalonia, the communists were now free to deal with their other rivals, the Pool, who had fought alongside the anarchists in the mere events of Barcelona. In June 1937, Pum was declared illegal, and an order issued for the arrest of its leaders. The first to be taken was Andres Nin, the Pum's general secretary. Julian Gorkin, another member of the Pum executive, witnessed his arrest. Another party member, Adroer Herodella, came up to my office to tell me that the police had come to arrest us and take Andres Nin away. I looked out of the balcony and saw Nin walking outside quite casually, surrounded by policemen. I never would have thought that I would never see him again, and the terrible tragedy that was being prepared for the death of Andres Nin. Nin was never seen again. He was apparently taken to this prison in Alcalá de Henares and later murdered by Stalin's agents. Other Pum leaders were later put on trial for treason. The price for halting revolution and restoring order to the Republic was high. Random terror was over, but the communists now controlled much of the political police. This nationalist propaganda film Made at the end of the war, allegedly shows communist torture cells in a Barcelona monastery. Freezing in refrigerators and disorientation techniques were used not only against Franco's agents, but also on the Republic's enemies within its own camp. Aragon was the last area still under anarchist control. In August 1937, the communist military commander Enrique Lista marched in to restore the central government's authority. The communist troops returned land to all those who had been forced to join the anarchist collectives. The central government, with communist support, had demolished the anarchist revolution and imposed its discipline. But at the front, the Republic was failing. Its new disciplined popular army
continued to be defeated. Shortly after its takeover of Aragon, the Republican army launched another offensive in an attempt to take pressure off the north. The first major battle was at the small town of Belchite. As so often happened, many Republican soldiers gave their lives to capture a town which was strategically unimportant. It was a battle that American volunteer Bill Bailey will never forget. What happened was that the fascists were so deeply entrenched that they made every single foot here at a costly expense to us. They were dead. Our dead was every place. Every street had men laying dead on it. Getting inside a house, getting them out of a house, the only way we could do it was punch a hole through the wall, throw a few hand grenades in there, blow that place up, punch the hole again, making, making it bigger, then go into the house, and by God, we did this hour after hour after hour until finally we was able to take one entire street. And uh, it was just, uh, you figure that on both sides, the, the, our men were doing it on that side, we're doing it on this side, we're taking the floor, we're getting into the basement, and we're, they're resisting every single place. So finally, after, say, four or five hours, we were able to take one whole street, and that was at a very expensive cost. Belchite finally fell. But only months later, the nationalists recaptured it, at very little cost. The Aragon offensive failed. The Republican army was weak on military tactics and had been torn by internal disunity. By the end of 1937, the Republic, its territory shrinking under Franco's onslaught, mounted another offensive. This time, the objective was the provincial capital of Teruel. In the bitter cold of the Aragonese winter, Teruel was conquered. Again, the Republic had won a bloody victory for an objective of little significance. These victory celebrations in Barcelona were premature. But the brave words of Catalan president Luis Campanche could no longer boost Republican morale. In January 1938, Franco's troops counterattacked and reconquered Teruel. Again, an initial Republican success had ended in disaster. The nationalist forces now prepared to push down from Aragon to the Mediterranean. As the Republican troops retreated, thousands of refugees streamed into Catalonia. The revolutionary battle cries now fell on deaf ears. Only young militants like Teresa Pamias kept their faith in a republican victory. Nosaltres teníem una actitud tan entusiasta i tan romàntica que no veiem, 
We had such an enthusiastic and romantic attitude that we didn't even notice how ridiculous we looked when we climbed up lampposts to harangue all those poor women and many children queuing up to buy a bit of bread. We would shout from the lampposts that the fascists would not pass, that we would win the war and all lead better and happier lives. This may sound like demagoguery now, but at that time we really felt it. By February 1938, the nationalist troops were marching towards the sea. The offensive threatened Catalonia, the revolutionary heartland. But there, as in the rest of Republican Spain, the revolutionary spirit of 1936 was now only a memory. On April 14, 1938, nationalist troops reached the Mediterranean and the Republic was cut in two. As Franco's troops celebrated, the Republic summoned up its remaining energies for a battle to prevent its final collapse. Mm -hmm. 